Feel comfortable? Yeah. You ready to go? Ready, baby. Lewis Howes, man, in the house. I'm excited, man. You, uh, you hold a special place in my heart because we started this podcast journey basically at almost exactly the same time. I think you started a couple months before me, right? Maybe, yeah. Like I think I had like a two month lead. Yeah. Yeah, I was the big expert at that point. You or were, man. I was like, <laughs> yeah. what do I do, Rich? What do I do? But I remember vividly you had just moved to LA and we had been introduced. Uh, and, and, uh, and so I made my way over to West Hollywood, your pad, and you were in like some temporary apartment situation and you broke out like the crappiest little mics, you know, like tiny little mic. And I'm like, all right, let's do this. And, and we had a great conversation. Um, and then we talked about podcasting and like what you, what your vision for what you were doing Uh was that time. And. It was cool, man. We connected then, and then we sort of been on each other's shows yeah. a couple times, and we've been on this, you know, journey separately, but kind of together. Like I'm always checking in on you. What's he doing? How's he growing? Wow! And you just exploded. So Thanks, I'm proud man. of you. It's really Thanks, cool man. to see. It's and, fun. Uh, well, I always look at your stuff because you have the best newsletters. You have like the cleanest design, and I'm always like, gosh, he's got such good design. So I always I, appreciate I, the way you deliver your message. I appreciate that, man. I, I put a lot of time into it, probably too yeah. much, you know, but like, I like the details. The like OCD, right? You're yeah, just like a little bit, it. man. To my, to my detriment at times, I think, you know, you're, and you're, you all, you would always say to me, man, you got to move forward. Like, just keep going. Keep, you know, go, you know, let go a little bit, let people in. You got to systematize and I would like clutch on, like trying to control every little detail. And I've gotten, I've grown a lot in that regard. Like I've gotten a lot better. I have a team now and Mm -hmm. I have support and it's been amazing, but I still have that like impulse, you know, that I'm trying to overcome a little bit. I hear you, man. It's hard for me. I wanted to, cause when I started years ago in the online marketing space, I did everything myself from the newsletter to the social media, to the customer support, to the sales and marketing webinars. And I wanted to learn it all. But I think as I've let go more and more, it's like my business has grown. Uh-huh. So even though it's yeah. like, oh, people make mistakes and I get frustrated sometimes, but it's like, you know what? I want to be able to grow as fast and I got to be okay with some of those mistakes because other people are going to make mistakes. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's ultimately how you got to, you got to let go to grow. Yeah. Right. And so now you got like all these people that come over to your apartment every day. Yes. <laughs> like yeah. work. Do you ever feel like it's like encroaching like encroaching on your actual like Sometimes. your personal private yeah. space like do you ha- are you able to like create a boundary around that because they're literally like walking around your bedroom not in my bedroom kind of but i mean it's Close. all right there you Close. know what i mean how many people like you got like five or six people over there yeah basically, i think we got eight day. to ten <laughs> total but some, half of them are you're gonna have to cities. get a real office i think they're, at some in, point. they're in other cities so it's okay oh, okay there's like five or six here locally and it just depends on the record days then we have more people in there but if they're not if I'm not recording a podcast, then mm-hmm. it's my space. I think, like, if I grew to three to six more people, I'd probably get another space and, yeah. like, just do a little co working thing and figure it out. Right. So, uh, the dogs are barking. Hey, man, it's real life. It's real life. We're baby. living authentically here. We're in you know? Calabasas, Malibu, <laughs> you know? So I, I'm interested before we get in, we're going to unpack the book and, and, you know, your journey with masculinity and all of that. And you did a great job with this book. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm excited You're for You're in you. at the first page. Um, <laughs> thanks for dropping my name <laughs> in on there. Uh, but before we do that, like, let's just camp out a little bit on the podcasting mm. thing. Like, I'm yes. just interested in what this journey has meant to you, like where you see it going. You know, Dude, I think, I don't think either of us could have foreseen at that time when we first met that, that, you know, each of our shows would have the reach that they have. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, I certainly have thoughts and opinions about like what it's meant to me, how it's changed my life and how I approach it, how I think about it. You know, what is my responsibility to the audience and mm. to finding the right guests and all of that? Like, how do you think about all that? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot I want to unpack, but for me, it's, I mean, it's almost been five years for you. Because I think you yeah. started in October. Of, end, end of November, I think. End of November. Because yeah. it's five years for me and end of January. Right. So, yeah, we're coming up on the... F- I can't believe it. Five, five years, man. Years. It's crazy. It has changed my life. It's changed everything about my business, my life, my relationships. And it's been an amazing platform because I've always wanted to share my message, but I didn't know the best way to deliver it. So, this has allowed me to have impact on people. And we do... A, you do a retreats. I do events. And just to see, you know, almost a thousand people come together who found the podcast and found meaning in some insights they heard on the podcast and to say, I'm going to fly around the world to come to this experience, to meet other people who listen as well, see speakers. It's so 
amazing. I just don't know anywhere else I could uh, could have done that uh, mm-hmm. and deliver it in such an intimate way where people are listening for an hour, mm-hmm. you know, have headphones on or in their car, their commute, their workouts, when they're going to bed, when they're waking up, some of the most intimate times for people, they're listening. And when you say, you know, I really think about my audience and curate the guests carefully because I, I'm sure like you, I have a lot of friends who I'm like close with who who will hound me and like, hey man, when are you gonna have me on? Yeah. And even not that close of friends, but just like well known business people or successful entrepreneurs or whatever it may be. There's a guy right now who's messaging me a lot, who's got a book coming out, who's just messaging me like, I'm not gonna take no for an answer. And I'm like, listen, I say no to my family members, to my friends who I like love. And it's not about you, it's about the community. And it's not about me and our relationship, it's about the community. And there have been times in the past where I had people on because I felt pressure to, and it wasn't effective. It didn't get results from my community, and they, they questioned it. They were like, why'd you do this? So I've learned to really make sure that I'm aware of who I'm having on, the topic, the conversation, the flow of it, to serve my audience in the biggest, the biggest way. Because yeah. if not, I feel like it's doing a disservice to the audience. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I was just talking to David about this the other day. Like, I'm in the same situation. And I'm a people pleaser Me by too. nature. I and know. I have people who, uh, you know, I have somebody who's messaging me a lot right now. And, and I feel like, I, and I, I'm like a conflict avoidant person. So I just you don't just deal don't with reply. it. Yeah, yeah and like, it's like, oh, I'll let but you know. I feel like, I'm like, please don't ask me to be, you know, it's, it puts me in an awkward situation because like you, it's like, I'm thinking about the audience. What is the best, you know, who, who are the best people that I can bring on? And, you know, I don't do, you do more episodes per yeah. week than I do. So I'm looking at, okay, so that, that leaves me 52 people a year. You're doing like, one a week. Yeah, I do. Sometimes I do a second one, but those are usually like Q and A's that I've done or things like that. So you need fifty two so, of the highest quality. Yeah, so I'm trying to find, and, and, and it's not it's not like the most famous person or the most accomplished. It's like who's the right fit? Mm-hmm. Who can I gel? Like who excites me? It's just as much about like who. Like I, I've learned to trust my intuition, and I've made that mistake of everybody says you need this person on, and I'm like, if you're uh, not I, excited I guess, though, and then I do it, and then because I'm not as into it as maybe somebody else is, then it ends up being lackluster and it doesn't deliver. It doesn't land. That's the challenge too. I've got my publisher is actually trying to send me other authors that they publish as well. They're like, well, you have this person on and this person on. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, they expect me to do it. And I'm like, listen, my audience, you know, if I'm not interested, if I'm not excited, if it doesn't make me curious, then my audience isn't going to be excited either. Yeah, they'll know. They'll see, they'll see through but, it right there. But and then, then they kind of make me feel bad and pressure me more. And I'm like, guys, come on. Well, it's a, it's a problem of success because it, yeah. it now, like I remember in the beginning, it's like I'm scouring the earth trying to yeah. get somebody to come on who will say yes. And now it's an embarrassment of riches because <laughs> you get to choose, you get to choose. And that yeah. comes with it. And that's amazing. And I get emails from publicists like pitching book and all that kind of all stuff. So you have access now that I didn't have. Uh, or if I tweet somebody, like I can get a response and yeah. it didn't used to be that way, but that carries with it the responsibility to make sure that you're serving the audience and what's in their best interest. And how do you curate, you know, these guests to create an experience that, you know, takes you from one guest to the next Mm -hmm. and creates kind of a thematic through line with what you're trying to accomplish. Do you feel like you've lost any friends because you've said no to people or like people stopped talking to you because you want to have them on or, I mean, I don't know if it's gotten that, bad but you know it definitely it's just awkward you yeah. know it was it's just awkward i was at a con i spoke at a conference uh a couple of days ago and there were a lot of people there and it was you know it was like a thousand people and it was amazing and i there's nothing more gratifying than spending a couple hours afterwards like talking to everybody who comes up and like yeah. i want to give everybody the most attention i can because they're telling me you know their their personal stories you know and that's a beautiful thing that you want to honor and cherish but there's the occasional person who then you know gives you their card. I'd love to be a guest on the show. It's oh like it's or not gives a public you their it's book not a, or whatever. It, yeah, yeah, and it's and that's nice. You know, like if I had a book, I would do the same thing probably. But uh-huh. it's not a public access service. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, yeah. And it's easy for me to like um, not be as mindful about that boundary 
as I should be, and I get myself into trouble, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to learn to be better, because it is about the audience, right? It is, man. Otherwise, you'll lose the audience. Yeah. Ulti- yeah, ultimately, you, you know, it works across purposes with what yeah. you're trying to do. Yeah. But you've grown this thing into, like, a massive enterprise. It's, it's been cool. powerful, man. I had no idea, like you, that it would take off this way, and, you know, my last two books are because of the podcast, the information I gained from the interviews I did, I turned into books. Um, you know, events, courses, programs, speaking, you know, all these, getting on Ellen, you know, all these mm-hmm. things have happened because of the podcast. They wouldn't have happened without the podcast. It was a, it was a, uh, I think we were at, you know, it's the one, I look at it like it's the one time in my life where I feel like I was at the right place at the right time. Because it, it wasn't cool when we started, but no. it was, we were on the cusp of it becoming Before. something that yeah. nobody could have foreseen. Because I think at that time, what people don't remember or realize is that, Podcasting was around from 2006, somewhere around then, and it just kind of was a stagnant thing. You know, it was kind of growing, but like no one was really listening, no one was catching on. And when I started, I didn't think of it, uh, uh, you know, I didn't think of us being like early adopters. Yeah, because we it were like, like a cool thing years to do. late. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it had been going on, but there was no indication that this was on the cusp of becoming uh, a mainstream way to consume content. Mm. You know, and what's yeah. special about it is what you said earlier, which is it is so intimate. You know, it's the one yeah. form of media that you can consume while you're doing something else and people have their earbuds on and you're, you're like right into their brain. You know, it's crazy. And I'm sure people say this to you all the time. Like, oh, you know, I go to bed with you every night or I yeah. listen to you when I'm cooking or on the treadmill or when I'm commuting every day. And, and a relationship develops, you know, and I know this because I listen to other podcasts and I feel like I'm friends with these hosts that I've never met. There's something really like you know uh, powerful about that, mm-hmm. and I think it is important as a host to to remember that and make sure that you're honoring that all yeah. the time. Yeah, exactly. And it's easy to get you can get starry eyed and you know chase these people who look great on paper, but not necess- are not necessarily the best people for the show. And, right. and I found, and I'm interested in what you think about this, like. It's super fun to interview famous people. I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. Like, that's like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm sitting and talking to this person. You know, I can't believe they agreed to do yeah. this. But they're so seasoned at doing interviews that it's really difficult to... They don't open up. To, yeah, because they're just like, okay, they're going to do their spiel. And yeah. I feel like you almost have to exhaust them or you got to interrupt and throw them off their game or do something like, how can I make this different or unique? Like, how can I... Um, approach this from a different angle and that can be difficult and so sometimes those interviews end up being not as um, impactful just because it feels like it's on the surface Mm -hmm. you know I agree that's why I have a process every time before I interview someone I ask them a couple of questions to get them ready to open up and I ask them is there anything off limits before Mm -hmm. we start I build rapport we're connecting hanging out but then I say okay is there anything off limits that you don't want to talk about and usually, most of the time, they say no. If they say yes, then I say, well, usually that thing will actually be the most impactful thing we talk about. So I try to get them to say yes to mm-hmm. the thing they don't want to talk about, to talk about. And then I ask them, um, okay, do I have permission to take this anywhere and everywhere to make this the most impactful thing you've ever done? And I just give it a beat. And usually they're like, oh, okay, this is about to be something interesting. Mm-hmm. And then I say, what would make this the most powerful interview you've ever done? What would we have to do, say, go, be? And then I think just constantly kind of confirming and grounding into that, like this is going to be something different. That's helped me before trying to like pull something out of them. It's like they're already in like an open state, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And it's been really effective. That's that's smart, man. I like that. That's interesting. Yeah, ask ask the person, is there anything off limits that you don't want to talk about? I definitely do that because I want them to feel comfortable and Mm -hmm. I want them to know like, hey man, I'm not here to burn you. Like I want, and I say like, look, when we're done with this, if you, you know, a day later, you're like, I wish I didn't say this thing or I misspoke about this. Can you change? Like, I'm, yeah, man, I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I'm not here to mischaracterize you. Yeah. That's not what this is about. Like, I just want to create that sense of comfort. Um, but I like that, that follow up line of questions is yeah. interesting. Yeah, it helps. Have you, um, have you uh, been in that situation where somebody's on your show they're well known but they're not really like they don't they don't totally know who you are or what you do and so they're like what am i doing here like my publicist told me to be here but like yeah i had i had i had, I had a couple of those ones yeah i had meatloaf on oh, and did. that was that was interesting <laughs> because 
he was more just like constantly talking about his like new record or whatever his new cd uh-huh. and he was like constantly talking about it and i was like okay let's talk about other stuff and if you're if you fascinate my audience, I'm sure they'll support you. But if you just talk about the thing the whole time, like if I was just here talking yeah. about, get my book, get my book, like every 10 seconds, it'd be like a boring interview. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like don't talk about the thing you're trying to promote and give such amazing value that people are like, I want to support this person. Yeah. Like with whatever they have. Usually we have authors on where we're selling books or whatever, promoting books. And um, yeah, and I think he's older and he's just kind of like, you know, doing his thing, whatever. But. Yeah, he was I mean, still great. You know, it was just it's it's. Uh, I mean, look, you know, we both have these outlets, and so when people have books coming out, like you do, like they want to get it out there, yeah. and like I'm happy to oblige if I like the person and I'm interested in the book is good and I'm interested in what they have to say, but but I'm not here to be just your Pitch publicity, man. yeah, yeah exactly. you know, service or whatever. So yeah, it has to be it has to be a blend like that. Add value. Give me ninety ninety five percent of all value, and then we'll talk about thing for five percent and then Mm -hmm. i'll do a big push around it you know Mm -hmm. and the more valuable the interview is i'm gonna promote it like crazy if it's not that interesting to me i kind of like barely put it out there i'm just kind of like yeah here you guys go you Mm -hmm. know but if i love it i tell my team like we got to make three uh, inspirational videos around this we got to make like all the quote cards like everything and blow it up and really wow the person so they'll share it so that's what we really try to focus on well you've got the internet figured out Try, man. I don't know. I'm trying to catch up to your design quality, you know? Yeah, you like, I, you know, I'm lagging in terms of, like, how I, how I utilize and leverage the Internet. I mean, I don't know. You know, I just, I could probably benefit from putting a little more energy and thought into it. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know. I have think to do less. What, what feels right to me yeah. also, I think. I think, think less about it. When you, when you look back on, on, how many episodes have you done now? 540, wow. I believe. Yeah, yeah so like, you've, like you started two months after me, but I'm, I'm at, there's how much should come up. Uh, I think I'm at 320 or something like that. Dang. So you put out like quite a few more. Yeah. We do I don't know two how interviews do a week, Monday, Wednesday interviews, and then like a five minute story. I'm starting to do more stories, like metaphors, parables, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, come on, come here, girl. She's fine. She's fine. Uh, and the story is actually really effective because I'm also like, there's only so many things I can come up with myself and like inspire or motivate. And so I'm trying to find more stories that I didn't even think of that are just great stories yeah. that people that can relate to people's lives right now. And it's been really effective. So cool. when you look back on those 500 plus episodes, like what do you, do you like, what, what mistakes do you think other than what we already talked about? Like, do you think back and like, I wish I hadn't done that or I could have saved a lot of time mm. or I, th- I wish I would have done video sooner mm-hmm. because I remember when you started that and you were like, oh, I spent a lot of money. I don't know a lot of money, man. There, all know? the gear, all the, the full-time editor. I mean, it was a lot and just trying to build up YouTube and all these things. I started at the end of last year, so about a year, a little over a year and a half with video. But I remember, like, Jonathan Fields had a video podcast starting, and then he switched to just audio. I know. He's still audio, I believe. And I remember being like, gosh, everyone's just going audio because it's so much work. And I was like, that's why I think I need to do video, because not many people are doing it, and it gives me another piece of content I can share on Facebook and YouTube and Mm -hmm. build other channels. So I just decided to invest in it. But in terms of, I wish I would, you know, I remember thinking like this was going to take off. I just had a feeling Mm because I was talking to Derek Halpern and Pat Flynn and a few other people who had podcasts back in 2012, 2011. And I remember like hearing them say like, wow, this is starting to pick up. Like before there was any news about podcasts or before serial and all these things, Mm -hmm. they were like, this is picking up for me. Like I didn't expect it to be and it's picking up. And I just felt like this was around, you know, four or five years ago. This is when smartphones, everyone was getting an iPhone. It was more accessible. The podcast apps were more accessible for people. And I was just like, I think it's going to take off. Mm-hmm. You came out with it. A few other, John Lee Dumas came out with it around the same time, I think, maybe a few months before you. And I was just like, I'm going to do a podcast. And I told myself, I'm not going to listen to anyone's show. I think what I did well was not listen to anyone else's. Mm-hmm. That could either hurt me or help me. I think it helped me because I was like, I came from a place of what's the thing I would want to hear? How would I want to hear the intro, the reads, everything? How would the flow be if I was a listener? And so I wasn't skewed one way or another to what other people did. Mm -hmm. I wasn't influenced. I just said, I'm going to create the podcast I'd want to listen to. And uh, I'm grateful for that. I think 
I don't know if I'd change much. Maybe have nicer equipment early on and, you know, do video. Right. But I didn't know what was going to happen. No, I mean, you know, you, you grow into it and you that's evolve. It. You know yeah. what I mean? I think that's an important lesson for anybody who's looking to create anything. Like, mm-hmm. go back and look at that person's first whatever. Sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you listen to my first episode, your first episode. You look at anybody, you know, any filmmaker's first video on YouTube, whatever. Like you'll realize like there's an arc and it's okay. You know, you mm-hmm. don't have to have it all figured out. And when people ask me, what's my gear, it's like, I don't usually answer. Doesn't it's matter. like, first of all, you can figure that out on the internet in five minutes. And it. It's not about that. You know, it's about like, what is it that you're, you want to express and just start doing that. And if it, if it clicks for you, you'll figure out the rest and you'll yeah. grow into it. That's it. Yeah. I didn't know how I was going to do. I was like, I'm going to do this for a year once a week and see how it does. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to do another year twice a week. So what, where do you see it going? Just keep doing it, or you have a plan you know, for growing? Like, I feel like it's it's going to continue to grow, but it's harder to grow as well because there's so many other podcasts. Now. Yeah, I so, mean, if we were starting now, forget about it. It'd be so hard, man. I know, so hard. But there's podcasts that are launching right now that are getting to the top and staying there because they're so different and so unique. And that's and, great, I think. Yeah, it's great. You know, and bring more awareness to the podcast space. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like. I personally, I want to be just a couple years ahead of the curve of what everyone else is, is willing to do because podcasting, when we did it was hard to do not people weren't doing it because they didn't understand it. It was still challenging to get it up. And I just was like, in a couple of years, this is going to take off. I just had that feeling like it's going to take off. And so I'm thinking of, okay, how can I continue to make this the foundation and grow the podcast, but leverage it into other things like books um, in other talk shows, TV shows, documentaries, Netflix shows, things like that, where I can find and curate talent and information and then build something even more beautiful around that one piece of content. But what's that one person I could do a documentary on that could be another multi-million dollar brand or a book series or something that's different that people, it's hard to write a book. You know, it takes a couple mm-hmm. of years, it takes a while to launch it to do the whole traditional publishing thing, it's challenging. Most people aren't willing to do that stuff. Most people aren't willing to do documentaries like your friends have done. And that's where I want to start going into because I believe that content, if we can continue to create powerful, meaningful content and spend a little bit of money into it to make it even better and stand out, that's going to be the difference maker. Mm -hmm. So are you actively developing some projects like that? I'm in the middle of a documentary right now. Yeah. I mean, I hired a film crew. They've they're they've been filming the last couple months of a process, won my live event, And you remember the movie, the secret. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of doing the secret on steroids, but mainstream, not like woo woo. Mm -hmm. And I'm developing that right now where, you know, this is the 10 year anniversary of me getting injured playing professional football. It was actually a month ago when I got injured. 10 years ago and I'm doing, I did this big event in Columbus, Ohio called the summit of greatness. So I brought my entire movement back to Columbus where I'm from. Um, and then I'm launching a book here in the next month and then I'm getting an award for the philanthropy, uh, philanthropist of the year award for pencil of promise uh, in December. Oh, cool. And I'm working on a few other projects in between. So I was just like, I want to capture all this three months, like the press, the book tour, like the, the, doc, the, uh, the event, everything. And I think it's going to mostly be tailored around this event because we had some unbelievable footage and great content. We did sit down interviews with every speaker, with them on stage, with the attendees, got stories of the attendees. So I think there's something there. You know, Tony Robbins did great with his documentary, I'm Not Your Guru. And then my friends, oh, I think you know Joshua Fields Milburn mm-hmm. from Minimalism. Yeah, Those, their, their doc did great. Crushed it. Blew them up. Blew them up. I don't know if he, I don't know if it's public, their, their numbers, but essentially they almost 10x their download numbers. Well, the their, month podcast, after. their podcast exploded, exploded in the wake of that. Because they had tour. it for a while, and then suddenly they were like, Blew up, you man. know, they were no. like in the top 40 or 50 on for iTunes. For like eight months. Yeah. yeah. And they said it was because of the documentary on Netflix. And their book tours were sold out all around the world and everything. And I was like, yeah, these two guys in our space, I think, did it well. Tony Robbins, I heard, I don't know the numbers, but I heard it tripled his business since the documentary came out. From his events to everything else, his courses, everything. Um, 
And then minimalism, those guys are just crushed with that. And I think they're doing another documentary. So I think that mm-hmm. is a space that is so untapped because they, one, they moved here from Montana. They moved here. They're you here, have to do more content. Now. Yeah. So I think Netflix, what Facebook's doing, Facebook Watch, I'm working on a show and developing. It's still not public yet, but we're developing a show with them right now. I think it's because it's people don't understand how to get on Netflix. It's not like an easy thing where you can just upload a piece of content. Mm-hmm. You know, you're working with agents and distributors and all these things, and they're expensive to get a good piece of content. You know, people aren't willing to invest. I'm willing to invest in spending a couple hundred grand on a book development and spending a few hundred thousand dollars on a documentary, which may not even be anything. It might just be a marketing piece for next year's event if I can't sell it because I haven't sold it yet. But I just believe in this vision that if I'm willing to invest in high quality content and great storytelling, that moves the consciousness forward in a positive way and helps humanity, I just believe it's going to work out. Well, I think you're well on your way. I mean, you're, you're, you're some of the greatness. Was this the third year that you've done that? Second, Second year. year? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, and just seeing clips that you shared like on Instagram and stuff like I know. that. I need look, to post more, but yeah. pretty crazy, It was man. fun. And, and I could see the development from the first year already just yeah. in terms of like your production value mm-hmm. and the, all of that kind of stuff. So yeah. It's cool, man. It's been fun. Yeah, I've yeah. never, I never, never did a podcast. Never wrote a book before. Never did a live event. I was not like an event guy. Uh, never done a documentary or movie. But I'm just like, I want to do things that excite me, that are challenging, but also that prove to myself that I don't have to have done something before in order to make something amazing and great. That I can learn on the go, and I can also create something that I would want to consume. So again, the podcast I created because it's the thing I wish I had growing up. The book I created because it's the wish I the, the book I could have read. The event is the the event I wish I could have attended. All these things and the documentary is the documentary that I would watch. That's what I focus well, on. Well, that's the only only valid way to approach any creative endeavor. I mean, it has to be from the heart mm-hmm. and what you want to express. If you start polling and like trying to figure out what an audience wants, that it's, it's not going to work. Yeah, you know? exactly. So, yeah. so who knows? I take a, you know, I try to develop a magazine last year, greatness magazine. I remember you talking to me about that. Yeah. Maybe we interviewed you for, we did three full issues that we never released. We had them all complete. They look amazing. They're so beautiful. Um, but it was like right around the time when the Apple like magazine app or news app transitioned to something else. And I was just like, this is taking so much of our time, so much money. And I don't know if we're going to make any money from this. So I spent all this money and six months of time and energy and just canned it. I was like, we're just putting it on pause. Mm -hmm. It was like two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually thinking about resurrecting it and bringing it back for next year. Um, so we'll see. I just like to do things that don't make money, but they're fun for me, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I also feel like, you well, know, what's the thing that will attract the most influential people in the world who could add value to my audience? I think having a magazine could feed the ego of all the publicists and be like, yeah, we want to get our client on our greatness that. magazine, mm-hmm. right? If you're going to put them on the cover, sure, we'll give you an interview. So it's like, I feel like that might be my way to get like Will Smith of the world, the, the rocks, the Jim Carrey's, all those people, because they'll do a, a magazine cover, but they may never do a podcast. Yeah. I don't know. I think Jim Carrey might, might, I think Jim Carrey might be more willing to do a long form podcast than a magazine interview. True. You Gosh, know, I talked based to, upon that viral. Did you see that? <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. I was talking to his publicist about two or three weeks before all this stuff came out. Cause I've been trying to get him on for a while mm-hmm. and um, I really, he's been one of my top three since I started the podcast. I would love to interview him cause I think it'd be fascinating. And I was on the phone with his publicist. We were like, she was like, I might be able to make it happen. I was like, I'll do whatever it takes. I was offering like $10,000 to donate to his charity. I was like, whatever. Cause I believe someone like that, the information that we, we do together is going to impact so many millions of people that it's worth me investing just to be able to spread some type of positive message. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's worth it to me. Yeah. So what happened? He was on, he was going like the Toronto film festival or something. And he was like, maybe we can have it happen there. And I was like, I'll pay you more if we can do it in LA. So I don't have to travel. And, um, I've been following up and she hasn't got back to me. So (laughs) we'll see. Well, you know, these things are, as as I'm sure you know, like timing is so important. Timing is everything. These things like, 
you know, I've done interviews that took me two years to, you know, yeah. it's a schedule because you and I, we, do, we only do them live, right? So it's like, you know, when's the person going to be here and are you available or when you're, you know, whatever. Like it just, these things are percolating all the yeah. time. So. Who's the biggest guest you got that you try to get for a long time? That you're like, um, I don't know. About. I got a few that I'm working on right now. You know, let's who's someone say. you did have that you were like took two years or whatever. Um, let's see who, uh, uh Moby was cool. Oh, that's, you cool. know, he was great. Um, Travis Barker was oh, awesome. That's sweet. Uh, I don't know. A couple of people like that. But you're in like the Malibu, like influencer crowd out here. So I feel like it's easy. You're like a little mm. pocket of all these people that live out here. Yeah. But like. Can it's you, it's different because you don't you don't run into people on the street you know everything's true. spread out out here like yeah I know people around here and stuff like that but it, that's not always how it works you know and, and I I've learned to like I don't force these things because right. I only want people to come on if they want to because yeah. it doesn't if they're like oh, if they feel like like oh well, they're doing a favor or something like that, it's not going to be good like I, I want them to be there because they want to be there yeah you know what I, I mean you. so I don't I don't like pressure anybody or anything like that and it's it's tricky when you live in Los Angeles, cause you meet a lot of people. Right. And like, you can't just roll up on, you know, you meet some cool person. You can't just immediately, I don't know, maybe you do, but like, you know, I don't like, I, I have to, I play like a, you know, like more of a coy, yeah, yeah. longer. You there's know, one thing. person I, I want to get to know the person first before there's actually someone I went up to that. I came on my show, uh, uh, Tay Diggs, uh-huh. who I saw him, but we had mutual friends and I had heard about him through a mutual friend for a long time. So I just went up and said, Hey man, you know, you've got a mutual friend. She told me to say hi. He was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, and then I mentioned my podcast. And he's like, oh, I'd love to come on. I was like, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. You know, should I follow up your publicist? And he was like, here, just take my cell. Right. So I actually went up to uh, LL Cool J as a guy I want to get on. And he follows me on Instagram. And he comments on my stuff and likes my stuff. Uh-huh. So I saw him at uh, a spot in L.A. And I went up to him when, like, he was done with his meeting. And I just said, hey, man, you know, big fan. And you follow me on Instagram and this and that. I'd love to get you on my podcast. I've reached out a few times. He goes, yeah, I'd love to do it. He's like, just send me a message. I go, I have, you haven't responded. He goes, <laughs> yeah. send me, he goes, DM me right now and I'll get back to you. So uh-huh. I did. And we've been, you know, trying to find a time. He's just like so busy, but yeah. Like knows? I said, you know, they happen when they're supposed to happen. They happen when they're supposed to. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about the new book, yeah. the mask of masculinity. Um, I mean, before we kind of get into it in depth, you know, I'm interested in what motivated you to, you know, explore this topic of masculinity and specifically, you know, how, you know, as men, um, you know, it can be difficult and confusing to, you know, understand how to communicate with yourself and with other mm. people and, you know, the kind of way that we're raised to uh, wear these masks yeah. in their various forms that prevent us from connecting with our own emotions and thus connecting with other people mm-hmm. and ultimately hamstringing our personal development and growth. Yeah. So like what, what began, the, you know, what, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting step from your first book, school of greatness. And then this is kind of like a, you know, a much more mindful, you know, soulful book yeah. than the first. You know, my whole life, I've always a couple couple things of why I did this. My Come whole here, life, <laughs> get the dog. Come here, girl. She's Come fine. On. She's fine. If you start petting her, then she'll never leave. That's so. why I stopped. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, you know, there a couple things. One, I like to do things that kind of shock people about me. Like I don't like to do the thing that people think I'm going to do. You know, I never drank in college or high school because people said that they thought I was going to be like a drunk jock. And I was like, okay, well, let me prove you wrong type of thing. I was like, I never wanted to be the guy that people thought um, or assumed I would do something. So on Gretchen Rubin's Four Tendencies quiz, you're a rebel. rebel? Yes, so much of a rebel, yeah. Um, So that's one. And two, I want to do things that are super meaningful to me and challenge me. And after the School of Greatness book, my agent and publisher were like, okay, let's do one on business and marketing. And I was like... It's just boring to me. It just does. It's not exciting to me. I was like, sure, I can sell a ton of these, but it wasn't what made me excited inside or interested or curious. And as I was writing the book and really uh, the school of greatness and really the a year and a half, two years before, 
I started opening up more about being sexually abused, which I've talked to you about. Yeah, we talked about that. About, you know, just being bullied, picked on, just, you know, and also not really having a lot of emotional awareness in relationships. I felt like I would always get triggered. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that, but I just never felt like I could end a relationship gracefully. I was so afraid to be alone. So earlier. what was your strategy? Like cut and run and then, you know, pretend the person doesn't exist or like what, when you would break up with somebody, it was like just constant back and forth, like arguing and stress. And I was like a coward always. Like I could never just end it when I knew like it was too long past, you know, sometimes you're like in the, I don't know phase, but it's like when you know, and you're like going on for another six to 12 months, it's like, okay, what's going on? Right. And I was afraid. I, th- I think I was emotionally afraid to not have that intimacy, have that connection, have that friendship, whatever it was. I was just afraid in my teens and early twenties. And I went through a, a pretty bad breakup when I moved here that made me so angry all the time. It made me just like go off on everyone else in my life, my business partners, playing pickup basketball and I got in a really bad fight where I put a guy in a hospital because we were we were just trash talking and fouling each other hard and then all of a sudden it turned into a fight in a there was zero stakes on this pickup basketball game there was nothing on the line it's just our egos flared up so much he actually hit me first but then I was just was determined to finish it like my ego was so hurt that I was like I'm gonna ruin you and it was about that time when The relationship was going all over the place. I got in these fights and my, I just realized I was more and more angry and resentful. And I started to open up about the sexual abuse. I went to a a couple of workshops that helped me kind of open up and start talking for the first time in 25 years. And I realized, wow, my entire life I've come from a place of, I need to be right and I need to win. And in order for me to be right and me to win, that means everyone else needed to lose and everyone else needed to be wrong. So zero sum game and, zero and sum this game. compulsion that comes from where? Yeah. Like what, what is the genesis of where that? Where did that, that come that from? That need to like, you know, be the I best think or I, win. A or... number of the, the events, you know, being sexually abused. I was picked last on sports teams. Oh, often. come on, dude. You, you were like a, you must have been the biggest kid in your class. I was, and I was athletic, but I was like in the special needs classes in schools. And I was always had the, uh, you know, it was me and like four kids with like in a wheelchair. And it was like always, they associated me as like the dumb, stupid kid. And so they didn't want to hang out with me. Mm-hmm. So it was more of like just bullying me or just kind of picking on me because I wasn't able to read and write well and had a stutter and all these other things. And it was just like, I was just like the awkward, tall, goofy looking kid that was picked on. And again, my story is not unique because I think a lot of people were picked on for whatever they had going on growing up. But that, my brother went to prison when I was eight years old for four and a half years. So I would visit him in a uh, visitor, visiting room at the prison every, uh, every Saturday or Sunday. And we should point out just for the listener that, that your brother has, has transcended that experience and yes. become a very accomplished musician. Yeah, he's the greatest jazz right. violinist in the world now. Yeah. And it's an amazing story. We're actually writing a book about that. Um, so I think those events, like a lot of that, and also my parents were kind of just arguing and fighting a lot and I never felt seen as the youngest of four my siblings were much older and it was kind of like the left I was just like there by myself a lot growing up so I didn't have friends when my brother was in prison really because the neighborhood parents didn't want their kids to hang out with me because they thought I was bad like my brother right you know I was in the special bad needs classes. association yeah, yeah so kind of all these things I was just always alone I felt alone you know my parents were there they loved me but it's just the story I told myself and I remember after getting picked last on the dodgeball in a dodgeball game, there was two team captains who were boys, and they picked all the guys first, and then they picked all the girls second, and then I was the last pick. And I remember saying to myself, like, I'm never going to be picked last again, and I'm going to prove all these kids wrong and the whole world wrong about who I am. I just kind of made that decision. So every day from that moment forward, it was me versus the world. I had to be the biggest, fastest, strongest person at everything I did, I had to just protect myself so that no one could hurt me anymore as this kid. That's how I felt. And as I evolved in high school, you know, people, you know, I became very valuable in sports. Mm -hmm. I was, so so you throw yourself into sports and football and this is your outlet to be able to express this anger in kind of a safe contained way. Yes. Um, But usually 
you know, that, that wound that you describe it comes with that inability to be intimate with other people because you've been hurt in that mm-hmm. way. Like you're not going to get too close to anybody. Right. And the minute you do get close, it gets scary and you break it off Absolutely, because it's too threatening because you're, because it, then you have to be vulnerable and that puts you in a position to be hurt mm-hmm. and you can't have that because you know what that's like, right? It so you got to cut it off yeah. and be in control of that situation to protect yourself. Yeah, exactly. So I think a number of those events kind of made me feel, well, here's the, here's the thing about it. These masks that men wear drive us to be, to achieve, to achieve something we want. For me, I wanted to be a great athlete. So I put on this athlete mask and it was hard to take it off at times, but I would achieve all my athletic goals that I had for myself and be unhappy after I'd achieved them. And I didn't understand why I was unhappy or unfulfilled. And so I would go after bigger goals and bigger dreams. And then I would achieve those thinking they would make me happy and they wouldn't. And I was like, what, why isn't, why am I not happy still? And I just thought this was the way of life until about four years ago when I started to just heal from this process. Like I never told people that I was sexually abused. I never told people about like how much it hurt me growing up feeling these things. I never just like shared it. And when I started to share, I felt like uh, this weight was lifted off my shoulders. What, what brought you to the realization that that was what you needed to do or what gave you the I courage? D- I to didn't start know it was what I needed to do. I was going to this uh, workshop actually that uh, an emotional intelligence leadership workshop and we're going through all the things that hold us back in our life from being great, all the different, um, you know, the triggers, the, the anger, the resentment, the, uh, playing small, all the things that we told ourselves that were holding us back from, you know, achieving the, the career goals, the financial goals, the relationship goals, health goals, anything that was holding us back from being better we address them. And a lot of these things came back from like our conditioning with our parents and childhood and things like that. So it was kind of like group therapy in a sense where they did different exercises and games to, to create real world situations. And about three days into this five day workshop, the, the trainer facilitator was like, and we'd gone pretty, I mean, people were crying people were like snotting, like, you know, it was, uh-huh. it was pretty deep. Like I didn't know it really, it was going to be that crazy but people are really going there to intimate vulnerable places about where they've been hurt, where they were held back, what they told themselves about how they weren't good enough, whatever it may be. And there was a point after three days of this where we addressed our parents you know, the childhood bullies, like everyone had their own stuff. We Mm -hmm. all addressed it. The trainer said, okay, after this moment, we're moving forward. We're letting go of the past. We've addressed everything. So there's no longer need to go into the past. We're going to start focusing on our vision for the future of what we want to create in our life. But is there anything, so if there isn't, if you haven't said anything you need to say yet, now's the time. Otherwise forever hold your peace. And I remember (laughs) going, uh, this is like to a room of like 50 of us. And I remember like it was silent and I'm kind of like going through in my mind, like these, these images. I was like, okay, my brother going to prison. I talked about that. Like my parents like getting divorced and like fighting all the time. Okay. Uh, you know, being bullied, being picked on. I like talked about these things and I was like at that time I was raped when I was five in the bathroom by another man that I didn't know. It just like, it was just like a vision that went through my mind and I was like, why have I never shared this with anyone for 25 years? I was just like, Hmm. Like I put it off in my head. Like it wasn't that big a deal. Like, Oh, this happened and I'm just going to put it to the side. And I remember just saying like, huh, why have I never shared it? And I felt like I need to share this. I was just like, came to me. I was like, I just need to share this. Otherwise I'll probably never share it. So I think if I didn't have that, like three days of experience, like leading up to this, where these like major interruptions, maybe making you know, other people being open and vulnerable and sharing things, like it was really a catalyst that inspired me to be like, okay, it's safe enough for me to talk about this in this context to these 50 people. And so I literally just stood up, walked to the front of the room. Like I didn't even raise my hand or say like, I have something to say. I just stood up and walked mm-hmm. to the front of the room. I couldn't look anyone in the eyes. I was looking down at the carpet the whole time. And it was for the first time I shared the story when I was five and getting raped in a bathroom. And I walked through detail by detail for the first time in 25 years. And I remember that I just could not look up and I was 
I told it like it was a movie and like I could see it. I could smell it. I could taste the experience, everything. I could put myself right there. And I walked back to my chair and right when I sat down, it was like, I just erupted with tears. Like I wasn't crying when I was telling the story, but I couldn't look people in the eyes because I was so ashamed. When I sat down, I started just erupting. Like my body was shaking. I couldn't, I wanted to stop it, but I couldn't. And luckily there was these two women on the side of me who were just like crying with me and holding me. And I was just like, I felt so ashamed, but also so relieved that I shared something that was holding me back emotionally. And I remember running out of the room because I was just like ashamed of myself. I was just like embarrassed and ashamed. And I was like, what are these people going to think of me? You know? And I went outside of this uh, workshop room out of the, the hotel where the workshop was into the kind of back street where there was a wall mm -hmm. near the back street. And I just put my head on the wall, my arm on the wall, uh, and it was just crying. I couldn't stop crying. And I just wanted to be alone. And one by one, the men from the room came up for me behind. I'll never forget this. It was really moving for me. They came up from behind and like just hugged me and looked me in the eyes and were like, you're my hero. And it was one of the, it was like, I never felt so seen in my life mm. when these men who were like, I was judging you the last three days just by your image and the way you look and you're this tall white jock. And I had no clue, like this is something you've been through. And it makes me respect you more. It makes me trust you more. It makes me want to connect with you and support you however I can. And these men were just opening up. You know, some, some of the men had been sexually abused as well and opened up for the first time. They started sharing with me what their experience was. And they were married with kids and no one knew in their family. Other guys who didn't have that experience were just like, man, I'm here for you. Like, thank you for sharing. Like, and it felt such a, like a release to be able to just share. And I started to share after this workshop, I started to share one by one with my family, which was really challenging to do, especially with my mom, because she's the one who found the babysitter and, you know, she felt totally responsible. Right. It was and all the these things. son of your babysitter. Yeah. He was like a 17 year old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like son. I was five. So the babysitter was like a, you know, 50 year old mother who was amazing. And she was right across the, uh, my elementary school, her house was across the street. So I just had to go there after school for a couple hours when my mom was still working until like five or six. Mm -hmm. and, and so I started sharing one by one with my family, which was really challenging because I was afraid they were going to, I don't know, not love me or not accept me or whatever. And I remember talking to like a, a relationship counselor actually about, you know, how do I even talk to my family about this? I had no clue. How do you, how do you say something mm -hmm. to your family or people you're close to? And so that's a whole nother process of how I was able to, to start the conversations. But then I, I did it with them and I was like, oh, wow, I have, they have deeper love for me. They had my brother, my sisters, they started opening up about things I'd never heard about them. They were like so, they felt so much more connected to me. It was amazing what our relationship has been like since then. Then I started sharing with like close friends one by one. And it was terrifying. Like I was terrified every time I did it with my family, then these close friends. Mm -hmm. But one by one, the more I shared it, the less I like teared up about it, the less I sh was embarrassed about it, the less I you know, felt like it had control over me. It was like now I was owning the story as opposed to the story owning me. Mm -hmm. And it didn't have power over me anymore after like months and months of talking about it. And then I, people were like, you need to share this on your podcast. And I was like, no fucking way. There's like no way that I want the world to know this about me. Cause I was still terrified. And then the more I said that I was like, Hmm, the story must still own me. If I'm not willing to reveal myself to everyone, but everything I've been through. Yeah. You're still afraid still and your afraid. ego is in the way. I was, and like, I was like, what are people going to think yeah. about me? Are they going to follow me mm -hmm. still? Are they going to, you know, or are they going to think it's some marketing thing I'm doing or whatever? Right. Like. I was just scared. And I remember it took me about six months to, to finally agree to doing it. And I, and, you know, I recorded it with Jonathan Fields and he kind of interviewed me to, to f go through the process. And I was pretty scared. Every, you know, during it, I was very kind of nervous still. And now I can talk about it where it doesn't own me. But what I realized is when I published this podcast about being sexually abused and kind of the whole process and 
what was available on the other side for me was freedom, was intimacy, was uh, not feeling afraid anymore of what people thought about me, not feeling like people are judging me anymore because I put everything out there. And a, a deeper sense of inner peace. Like I just felt at peace in my heart. Whereas I always felt angry and passive aggressive when I had these triggers. And so what I realized is like when I post this, I had hundreds of emails from men and women, but so many men that opened up to me for the first time being sexually abused or just going through some challenge in their life where they felt like, wow, if you could do this and share about your thing, then maybe I can share about my thing with Mm -hmm. my sister or my parents or my wife or whatever it may be. And it was just like, man. I, th- I thought I was like the only one who wasn't talking yeah. about this, but I guess everyone isn't talking about like the things they're most ashamed of or what they're afraid of. And I just said, huh, there's something here. It was like the most downloaded episode. It was the most shared. It was the most meaningful, the most impactful. And I was like, this is the topic, not necessarily around sexual abuse, but why do men wear different masks that hold them back? Why do men um, cause a lot of, resentment and anger and conflict in relationships with business, friends, family, intimate partners. Why do we do this as men? Not all men, but why in general do some men do this? And I realized that, you know, a lot of this conditioning over time from your parents saying like, you know, don't cry, don't be a cry baby, be a man, be this, your coaches, be a man, get back up, don't show pain from, you know, the confusion of relationships where, Women want a bad guy and they're, you know, the bad guys are rewarded in high school to then they want a sensitive person, but then they want you to be strong. Mm -hmm. They want you to show you. So it's like constantly conflicting. And I think, yes, we all have our own responsibilities to be the best person we can be. But when society, culture, family, friends, girlfriends, teammates are starting to have this pressure constantly to feel accepted, we need to be a certain way. To fit in, we have to fit in with to what they want us to be, not who we truly are. And being open, honest, and vulnerable is completely at odds with that. And our, so and our whole lives, and, you know, look, this is applicable to women, too. Absolutely. Like, but, but I think it's a little bit more acute <clears throat> with men because of the way we're sort of socially conditioned and programmed as we, as we grow into these gender roles. But the idea that you're going to be honest and open about your flaws and your failures and, and be vulnerable and expose yourself in that way runs contrary to everything we were taught growing up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I wasn't sexually abused, but I have my version. We talked about this. I have my version of this through alcoholism mm-hmm. and addiction recovery. Yeah. And, and one of the most downloaded episodes I ever did was when I talked about relapsing after I'd had a lot of time and after... I had completed writing Finding Ultra and before it had come out. And I was deeply ashamed of that because mm. I was like, oh my God, I wrote this book about addiction recovery, <sighs> you know, and, <laughs> and, here I and, am, my, like, and my journey to wholeness. And here I am still this perfection, incredibly yeah. flawed human being. Yeah. What does that mean? And what are people going to think? And I held on to that for a long time. I mean, first of all, just being an alcoholic in general, like my journey to being able to own that came through sobriety and recovery and rehab and, you know, everything that I put into creating a foundation of sobriety where that story doesn't control me anymore. Like I own it and I'm totally comfortable talking about it. And I've had that same experience where when you can, when people know when you're comfortable about it and they're like, they're not used to that. And they're like, Oh wow. Like it's not so bad. Like maybe I can share that thing that, I'm scared Mm -hmm. about or be a little bit more vulnerable than I have been, but there's always more layers, you know? And so like when I relapsed, I was like, well, I own that, but like, this is still owning me. Right. And I had to do the same thing and share it on my podcast. It was terrifying, you know, but that was the thing that, you know, people really connected with that and they didn't have to be an alcoholic or an addict, but just the fact that like I was willing to be that honest and it gives people, it connects, it, it connects you to people. And like, you know, Brene Brown talks about this beautifully. And I know you just interviewed her and like, she's my hero. I think she's, she's amazing. A, amazing dude. And you know, if you do anything in the wake of this podcast, other than, uh, read, read Lewis's book, please explore the work of Brene Brown because yeah. she's really, you know, dug into the research on this. And the truth is we're terrified of being vulnerable yeah, because we equate it with weakness. But the truth is, that is your strength. And if you mm. can muster the courage to be vulnerable and to like 
own your path. And it's a journey to getting to there. But when you can get to that place where it doesn't control you anymore, it is incredibly empowering. And it's the thing that that is going to connect you with other human beings and like infuse your life with meaning and purpose and direction. It's a beautiful process and it's terrifying. Like I'm not going to lie to you, it's terrifying. So, so, uh, so I understand like why we walk around with these masks on, um, you know, the enemy we know is, is much better than the, the, you know, the mysterious enemy that we don't. Right. Right. And it's stories like yours where, you can sh- you can lead by example and, yeah. and and really demonstrate this that that provides that opening that can shift you know people's perspective on these issues and give them permission to like own their own truth. Yeah, and that's what I realized when I when I started sharing more years ago, four years ago. People told me that they had permission to start opening up, and the release they had after sharing it was like they had the weight off their shoulders. Mm-hmm. Now they could finally step into who they're being. And I feel like if we have a mask on, if we're holding something back, we are never able to get into full flow in our lives. We may be 70, 80%, but until we're in full flow, which means being our authentic self, we can never have the highest impact or achieve the greatest results in our life. We're a little bit tight. We're have a little bit clenched. And you can't, you know, be an athlete if you're clenched. And you can't be an athlete of life if you're closed off. So... I realized, like, wow, so many men are hurting in, in the American society. And yeah, suffering the world. silently. Suffering. To, you know, quote Henry David Thoreau. Like, exactly. Because it's not, it's not okay. To, it's like, not okay to talk about it. Right. You can't talk about it with your boys. You can't talk about it with girls. You can't talk about it with your wife. Because when you do, they tell you, you know, in general, that they say, well, I need you to be strong right now because I'm all over the place. And so it's like there might have been one time you were told, like, no, you can't. I need you to be strong for me right now where the man thought okay i gotta be strong all the time then you know maybe and you know i love Brene brown i love oprah i love the people that are talking about vulnerability because it's transformed a lot of women's lives who feel like they can share but a lot of men aren't listening to Brene brown right who are unless they're like you know yoga socially conscious <laughs> men but yeah. the guys that i grew up with in general they most likely wouldn't be caught dead. Yeah, the barbecue and NFL, well, you know, just the Monday Midwestern, football, like, whatever. Like, yeah, yeah, they're not like, let's see what Brene has to say. No, they'll yeah. never watch that TED Talk. And I yeah. remember when I started getting into her work four years ago and learning more about this and learning about vulnerability and things, I was like, wow, this is so powerful. And yet no, not many guys are talking about it. And so I just felt like I had a responsibility. Well, you could be a cipher for that. I like, felt like you know I had a responsibility. I mean? yeah. Like, I look like the typical jock. I'm a tall white man, uh, you know, and I've had some business success. I've had some other success in my life as an athlete. So if I could be a Trojan horse or a catalyst to get people in, to get men in, to be like, hey, you want to live a great life? You got to open up. If you want to achieve, you want to make a lot of money, you want to get the girl, you want to be a great athlete, like, okay, you can do that. And you don't have to suffer. You don't have to constantly live in this prison inside of your mind and constantly come from an aggressive place, a win-lose place, uh, you know, and needing to be right all the time. Like that creates so much dis-ease in our hearts. And when we can come from a place of how can I win and how can you win and everyone around me win, like it just feels better. When we, when we come from a place of, you know, maybe I'm not right here. Let's, let's just hear it out. Let's have a discussion and, and see what we come up with together. You're not isolating yourself by being the only winner and the only person who's right. You're not being on an island by yourself in that place. Now you're connecting to a larger community of people and you're supporting humanity as opposed to creating the conflict that we're seeing so much in the world today. I think as a starting place, uh, the individual has to at least be in a place where they're willing to kind of wrestle with their demons a little bit. I mean, I'm just it's thinking, scary, of, man. It's you hard. know, like you're saying, Oh, well, the typical guy. All right. Like let's conjure the stereotype. Yeah. Like often that guy's so disconnected from his emotional body because of that programming and because of the coaches or the parent, mm-hmm. whatever it is that they're not even aware that they're repressing their emotions because that disconnection is so complete. So strong. So the, how do you even... Like, the mask is fused guy, to their faces. Yeah, like there's no distinction between the mask and the person. No. Like my, my, my wife, there's, there's one particular f- type of mask that my wife calls the super dupers. Like when you meet... You know, you meet... I'm sure in your business circles, you meet guys like this all the time. They're like, 
when you meet them and they give you that super firm handshake and they look at you in the eye and you're like, how are you doing? They're like, super duper. I'm, I'm so, I'm super. I'm so, how are you doing? You know, and you're <laughs> like, it's bullshit. You know, right. like that guy's not, this guy's not even in the universe of, of beginning to be honest with me about however right. he's feeling. Maybe that's not the right context or maybe he would be, you know, more open in a different setting. But in general, it's like a guy who's walking around like that all the time. He's just, I mean, the mask is so obvious, yeah. right? And it's such a barrier because you're like, all right, well, am I really going to have a meaningful conversation with this guy? Probably right. not. Like, I'll just go through the niceties and, like, move on. Right, exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I just feel like now is the time with more and more conflict in the politics, with more and more conflict with the racial issues that are happening. It just seems like everyone is fighting. At least and now with, public, with social media, it's just so mm-hmm. prominent. You see it so much. But I feel like there's got to be an interruption. And the only way to take the mask off is with an interruption, whether it be, uh, you know, a major breakup in your life, a divorce, a near death experience, someone in your life, near death experience, Throw a little pain in their direction. You've got to go Shake through some type of, because you're so pe- people are so attached to their identity yeah. and you're asking them to let go of essentially like who they are. Like that's a huge ask for me. The reason why it happened is because I had a major interruption. I was in this five day workshop where it took three days for me to finally like have a mirror in front of my face and be like, Oh, I have an ego. I didn't think I had an ego. I thought I was just like this good guy or I wasn't angry, but I was always angry inside. And it took a deep interruption where this facilitator just called me out on my bullshit like over and over in front of everyone he was like why are you so angry lewis he just kept saying why are you so angry and i was like i'm a fun loving like i hug people all the time i'm always happy i was like what do you mean angry He was like you're really angry it's like all over your face it's all over your energy and i was just like fuck you i was like you don't know me i was like (laughs) you you know what i mean you respond with anger exactly to defend your non-angerness but it's just like the more and more feedback i got i was like i started to open up i started to recognize uh the the mask i was wearing the, the 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 things that were holding me back and i needed that interruption it took me 30 years to have an interruption and i think I hear this from other friends who have near death experiences or other things, or it's like, that's their wake up call. So it's hard because I don't want anyone to have a near death experience or have to go to a workshop or any of these things to, to have that interruption. That's why I think it's so important for the women in the lives of men who have these masks to support as a loving interruption by not making men wrong for wearing it. Because I think in a lot of relationships, I hear men saying, my girlfriend, my wife makes me wrong for who I am and is constantly nagging me, these things. So I think women can play a part in being a loving interruption by coming from a place of love and understanding, by first being aware, like, why is he wearing this mask? As opposed to just making him wrong for who he is, let me look deeper. And this is hard to do when you're frustrated with your man for him being a certain way after years. I get it. It's really hard to do as a woman to, to kind of step into this loving awareness of understanding but i think if you want to see a transformation in the man in your in your uh your life your father your brother your husband boyfriend sons there's a lot of mothers out there who talk to me about their sons how they're disconnected it's like try to come from a place of why first that they might be doing that that's why we try to create the uh, the information on why someone might be wearing that mask and then some tools and resources on how to get them to take off the mask for a moment so you can have a intimate conversation with them. Mm-hmm. The best way to do that that I've found is through acknowledgement. Acknowledging the, your son, your husband, the boyfriend, your dad for the good they are doing. Focus on those good moments in the life where they do show a tender side or they, they, they are thoughtful or they are open. And just say, I really appreciate how you did that You know, the other day with so-and-so. It was so beautiful to see, and it just made me feel so much more connected to you and maybe want to have incredible sex with you. Whatever it is, got to say to like get them excited and encourage that as opposed to encouraging the mass or making the mass mm-hmm. wrong. Because when you make the mass wrong, you're probably going to push the man away or make them want to keep the mask on tighter to protect themselves. So just be aware of that. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I'm, as you're saying that, I'm sort of, you know, reflecting back on my own path with this and, and the role that, that Julie played. And, mm. you know, she was always 
like she could tell I was suffering, like mm -hmm. being a lawyer, you know, like wearing a certain mask and trying to make it work, even though it was at odds with this person that she could always see this better version of me. Mm. But I was too afraid to, you know, step in that direction and too afraid to let go of the mask I was wearing. And what did she do? And, what was well, her? she just she was like, I believe in you and like, wow. you're more than this. Wow. And you know, I, I have a vision for you. Like just, you wow. know, you need to trust your instinct, like you're suffering, like, let me help you. Or, and then at other times, like just giving me space, like, like she was like, you know, she went through like, look, <laughs> here's what you need to do. And then that didn't work. You know what I mean? Cause it's like, I don't want to hear right. somebody telling me what I should don't do. Judge me. Or but you. she just let go. And, and, you know, ultimately she got to a place of like, look, I love you unconditionally. Like you want to keep living that way. I'd still want to be married to you and I love you and we'll have a great life. Um, I think there's, you know, you have more potential to do things in other areas. Uh, but you know, this is your life. Like, she's like, I'm releasing you to your life. Like I am releasing you. Like, I'm sorry for vibing you or for trying to, com you know, feeling like I wanted you to Pressure be different you. than you are. Like, and it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a, uh, like a strategy, like she really meant it. Like I could tell that it was real. Like she wasn't yeah. just saying it, you know, like she was, she felt that in her heart. And I, and I noticed that shift. And, and I think that is what, like you talked about, like suddenly seeing yourself in the mirror, like that is what allowed me to actually see myself as I was in the mirror, because I had to then take responsibility for myself, not to please somebody else or my partner. Yeah. Right. And I think that was a huge catalyst in my growth, but you know, these things are hard and, and, you know, pain, you know, it's like the, that pain moment. Like if you, if that happens to you, that's a gift, mm -hmm. you know, as maybe as terrible as the circumstances may be, um, there's a, there's a divinity in that. If you can grab onto that and understand that it's a, it's a moment that you can grab onto and harness to begin this journey that, yeah. that you've experienced and it, it can be a beautiful thing, but yeah. you know, these masks come in many forms and you kind of, you know, you outline the book and break them down. You have like the nine material different masks, masks yeah. and the Joker mask and the stoic mask and mm -hmm. the, in, the invincible mask, the aggressive mask, the athlete mask, the sexual mask, the know-it-all mask, the alpha mask. Mm -hmm. I mean, just by their titles, you can kind of imagine how these, these things break down. Right. Um, but they're all powerful. And I don't think anybody falls. I mean, certainly there's a spectrum and, you know, you kind of, okay, the alpha mask, I, I kind of know who that guy is, mm. but I think most men are a hybrid of a number of these. And, and I think, you know, sure. what you did well in the book was that you entered this as a learning experience for yourself. It's not like, Hey, this is, this is the way that it is. And this is what you need to do. It's like, I struggled with this. And in each chapter, when you're kind of breaking down these various masks, you're like, this is what I, this is how I wore this mask. Or here's an example of like where I kind of went awry because of yeah. some example of something that happened in your life. And I think it, it allows people to kind of connect with that. Yeah. I mean, um, pretty much in every chapter I talk yeah. about all my faults, as a <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. how I've worn every More mask, vulnerability. how I've worn every mask, how it supported me in my life and how it didn't support me. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm not trying to come from a place of like, you're a wrong man if you wear a mask or you're bad. It's not about right and wrong, good and bad. It's about what's effective and what's working and what's not working. Mm -hmm. And are you suffering inside by wearing this mask? Is something holding you back from living a, a fuller, richer life? In your relationships, your health, your spiritual health, everything. And if something is holding you back, Let's address it. Let's look at it. For instance, the material mask for me saved my life in a sense, because when I was broke on my sister's couch, I fixated on making as much money as I could so I could get off the couch. So I said, I'm going to become a master at making money. I no longer want to feel broke. I want to feel like I have abundance in my life financially. So I spent the next year and a half, two years only thinking about money and I gained 60 pounds and I had no intimate relationships but it got me to make, get, to make a lot of money. So it's like, okay, it supported me in some ways to getting the goal that I had in mind, but it left me feeling so unfulfilled in the rest of my life. So it's like, how can we balance this and be aware and take it off in certain times? Mm -hmm. you know the scary, I mean? yeah, no, I get that. And I think the thing that, that happens, I think, is that guys get in their lane, right? Yeah. And if you, you take a successful guy, Maybe he's wearing the material mask. Maybe uh -huh. he's wearing the athlete mask, whatever it is. He's excelled in his life and 
if you were to ask that person, they will tell you the reason that they excelled is because of the mask. And now you're proposing that they let go of that. And yes. that means that they'll no longer be able to do the thing that they do. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's the fear. And that's the unknown. Well, yeah. And so, yeah. so it's a leap of faith. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who's taken that leap yourself and, and I have as well, we can both say like, look, the water's warm on the other side. It's going to yeah. be okay. Like yeah. that's an illusion, that attachment to that identity yeah. and that strategy and that mask is, although you think it's serving you, it actually isn't, but you're going to have to trust me. Mm -hmm. It's hard. And here, here's the thing, you know, it's like, let's use the material mask for an example. Like, I'm all about having nice nice things, like living in a nice place, flying first class. Like, I'm all about convenience and all these things. But I think if I was posting about all my material possessions every single day on social media, talking about how much money I had constantly, I would attract a certain crowd and I would attract people close to me who probably were thinking about the same things, were, were focused on the money. So I would ask myself, like, if I didn't, if I lost it all, would those friends still be around? Did I make an impact in their life or did I have meaningful connections with them beyond the money? Or was that the thing that attracted them to me as well? So I think you just need to ask yourself, like, as, again, if you're an athlete and then you get injured, are your friends going to stick around? Is your entourage going to stick around if you're no longer playing in the game, whatever sport you're playing and you no longer have the money? Did you make an impact in people's lives? Did you build meaningful, intimate relationships? If you didn't, those people probably aren't going to stick around. But don't, don't allow your, your net worth to reflect your self-worth. And the same thing with your athletic capabilities and everything else. Figure out a way to develop your self-worth first and build meaningful value in other people's lives. And if you make a lot of money, cool. But at least you have the foundation first of self-worth. Yeah. The, the tricky thing is, is like most rich dudes are <laughs> there. There's that's what their self-worth is wrapped up in. It's you know focused I mean? on their bank account. Like yeah. if their bank account goes down, it's like they have a heart attack. And it doesn't matter that it's not solving the happiness equation because there's always one more thing to get because the other guy has it and you don't. And always. you can, you'll chase the, I mean, look, you lived that we life, live, right? You were well, lower I mean, your life. We and, live in Hollywood, you know, it's like yeah. those guys are all around. I know, I, look, I know tons of millionaires and, you know, billionaire type guys that are not happy people, you know, but they still, they're on that treadmill, you know, and it's going to take, you know, something pretty severe in their life to, to, to get them off of that and, mm -hmm. and reevaluate. Who's the guy who lives up here? The uh, famous director who lived in a massive mansion. He actually directed all the Jim Carrey oh, Tom movies. Tom Shadiak. Yeah, 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 with the longer hair. Yeah, and now yeah. he lives in like a trailer park or something. Yeah, he or... moved to Boulder for a while. He's he's back. I've been trying to get him on the podcast. Probably to get him yeah, too. He's yeah. amazing. Yeah, but he, yeah, that, he made an amazing uh, documentary. <clears throat> it's called I Am Not, I think it's called I Am Not That or something like that. Mm -hmm. I forget the name. David, do you know that documentary I'm talking about? I forget the name of it. It's something like that. But mm -hmm. Basically, yeah, one of the biggest directors in Hollywood had everything, had mansions, mansions, all kinds of stuff, everything. directing giant, you know, comedies with all the big movie stars, Jim Carrey, et cetera, and just was like, dude, it's not, you know, dude, it's like, bring him happiness. no, not at all. And he, he just basically quit being a director, uh, sold all his belongings, moved into a, moved into a trailer in Malibu. A there's nice a, trailer. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it wasn't like, I know, like there's a, there's a little area in Malibu where it's like a, it's like, technically it's a trailer park, but these are like amazing trailers. Like you know, it's like, dollar yeah, trailers. they're yeah, still yeah. like super <laughs> nice, right at Paradise Cove. So I think he moved But it's not there, huge. It's like the size of this. No, like, they're like, yeah, they're small. They're, but they're cool. You know, yeah, it's not like. He's living know, nice still, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, but it's an incredible documentary where he kind of, you know, talks about all these things. Yeah, I want to watch yeah, that. Yeah, it's not true. I mean. Look, we know it intellectually. Like yeah. everybody knows, oh, money doesn't buy you happiness, blah, blah. But it's like, but actually believing that, mm -hmm. like we sort of go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like if I just get the Tesla, it buys you or convenience. If I just get the thing. Well, it buys you convenience. You know? It buys you like a more comfortable life. It buys you these other things that, mm -hmm. you know, lack of money can't get you, but it doesn't buy you inner peace. And I think that's the thing as men we struggle with is finding this sense of like inner peace and inner fulfillment. And, if we're constantly chasing something, thinking that it's going to give us inner peace without addressing the things that are holding that peace back from us, that's where we get into trouble. So it's how can we address those things now 
and then go make billions of dollars and you're gonna be happier but you got to be willing to go on that journey of self-discovery and you're gonna have to get used to the idea of being open and vulnerable you know like it, it and a lot of these things date back to these childhood wounds That's it. you know i interviewed this guy on the podcast gabor mate who's an expert in addiction and his whole thing is you know so many addicts like it's rooted in these childhood traumas and and even when you look back on your life and you're like, well, I wasn't abused and yeah. you know, my parents weren't alcoholics, but there's, there's some something. kind of there's psychic damage. There's emotional trauma there left unresolved or left unaddressed and unexamined is toxic in your life. And it's manifesting in these mm-hmm. behavior patterns yeah. and these these sort of mentalities that are, you know, that get firmer and firmer as we age and, and, and form the very basis of our identity that ultimately are leading us astray from the thing that we seek most, which is purpose and meaning and satisfaction and, you know, and, and, and to love and to be loved. Yeah. Right. And, and, and we're all chasing it in the wrong directions. And it's confusing because as men, I think it's in certain respects, and I'm interested because you're so much younger than me and what you think about this, like, you know, the great generation, the world war two veterans, like, look, this, you be, this is what you do as a man. Like it was pretty clear cut. There wasn't a lot, there was nobody was writing books about (laughs) the mask of masculinity. (laughs) You know what I mean? And then Vietnam happened and we have the sixties and there's an openness and it's the flower generation. And then we have gen X and all the angst that gets built into that gen Y. Now we have the millennials. And so the millennials are this generation of people who are by their very nature, not to be overly stereotypical, but more in touch with their emotions. I'm talking about men as much as women. Uh, it's a it's a permissive generation in which, you know, it's okay for dude friends to like share intimate details of their life in a way mm-hmm. that like perhaps was not okay in my generation and generations that preceded me. Um, but also, I would imagine there's also that that conflicting expectation that, you know, the dude still has to be strong and he's still, you know, he's got to be the gentleman and he has to be the warrior and he has to be uh, the the super dad who's going to all the things at the school. But he's also got to be the provider who's making sure that he's bringing home the money, you know, and, and he's got to be sensitive. And so there, it's like a, and calm and, and like, it, like there's all of these intelligent. Yeah. yeah. And, and like it's not this is not a pity party for men. Like I, Same I think thing it's, for much, women it's too. much harder for women. Same all thing. of these things apply to them. Yes. And they've got to be and sexy and all the time. More, and, yeah, exactly. You know, so cook food and yeah, take care of the these kids. conflicting yeah. gender expectations that create like a sense of vertigo because mm-hmm. you, you can't be all of those things all the time. How does that balance? balance out and like what is the path forward in terms of like being self-actualized and authentic to who you are yeah I think the so path, that's the equation right yeah I think what's the, the solution Lewis the path, come on you wrote the book the solution is to first be aware of the mask that you're wearing mm-hmm. first be aware is to okay and be aware and then say why am I doing this why and start to journal like what are the things that I still hold on to what are the things that I don't like talking about what are the things that I get triggered around and start start to have it written down on a piece of paper in your journal and be aware of it. Be like, okay, here are some things. It's good to know. It's good to be aware. And the next thing is like saying, okay, what's the next step for me? How am I going to be able to move past this? Who do I need to talk to about this? Whether it be my guy friend, girlfriend, wife, parents, whatever it is, who do I need to address and clear things with so that these things don't own me anymore? but I'm in control of them. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great first step and it's an ongoing process. Listen, I wrote the book on this, but it's like, I still wear these masks. You know, it's not like I'm like this perfect, actualized, aware, sensitive, loving, Uh vulnerable man 24 seven. I get triggered like the best of them. That's why I have daily practices of meditation, which I know you do of gratitude of looking into people's eyes and connecting with them. I also am constantly in appreciation. I'm always saying how much I appreciate people throughout my day, throughout my experiences. And then coming from a place of gratitude, gratitude allows me to just be focused on the little small things that I'm appreciating as opposed to fixating on things I'm ungrateful for or the things that trigger me or the things that make me meet mad or aggressive. So it's those little daily practices mm-hmm. that really guide me. And also surrounding myself with a good team that I say, hey, listen, give me feedback. If I'm being aggressive, if I'm being this, if I'm being whatever, give me feedback in a loving way. Don't get mad at me because that's going to make me triggered more. 
but just let me know in a loving way like hey i feel like you're disconnected from us right now and so i have a really good team you know i would say my personal life team and also my business team they're all grounded people who give me great feedback i think it's you know setting yourself up the best way you can because mm-hmm. we're going to go through a lot of challenges for the rest of our life especially if you're up to a big game in life you're going to go through challenges and adversity so just try to set yourself up to win and and don't beat yourself up so much for having these things like don't put yourself down more now that you're aware of these things just be like okay how can i be at peace with this how can i let it go and be aware of it so next time it comes up i see the mask on and i take it off quicker and that should be our goal Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's pretty good practical advice you know I, i i think it's important as a first step if you're suffering or you have some level of self-awareness of some dissonance within you or some behavior pattern that that you know is unhealthy but you're not sure what's behind it i think the first thing is to find somebody that you trust to speak to yeah and 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 to find to find somebody who you can confide in openly yes. and honestly and like tell like tell just anything be as and everything. brutally honest and open as you possibly can you feel so much better when you talk you've got to release that got to share yeah and it's that's tough if you've never done that because it requires so you to trust hard. somebody, you know, and I, and I honestly don't think, and I'm sure you've done, you've done a lot of like therapy or recovery stuff, mm-hmm. I'm assuming, but I don't think we can heal until we start to share. Instead, we start no, to verbalize. You're only as sick as your secrets. That's, mm, that's, that's good the one. thing, man. Yeah. And so you've got to find that. And I think it's, I think journaling is super important and there's all kinds of exercises that I've, that I've you know, done over the years. One thing that's really powerful <clears throat> is to kind of inventory certain situations and interactions you have. So let's say your anger flares up or you end up in a fight with your girlfriend or boyfriend or something happens at work, like to actually do an honest and open inventory of what exactly happened and try to see and yeah. own your part in that. Like, yeah. cause everybody kind of comes out of those situations blaming the other person or being a victim or like this they did that and they did this but like let's get really honest about like what your part in that was Mm -hmm. and the more you get into the habit of doing that patterns start to emerge and you start to go oh i see like when this happens like i always get anger angry or this is how i react like why am i doing that and that can like catalyze a more of a deeper inquiry into like what's behind that and then you can begin to unpack that. And that, I think that's, you know, a, another first step in, in starting to resolve Absolutely. and heal it, you yeah. know, to find somebody you trust. So, I mean, there's a million, you know, modalities. It's just like, it's not, it's like, there's no one, there's no right way no. or r- one way. It's like the, what's the way that you're going to do, you know what I mean? Is it going to be group therapy? Is it seeing a therapist? Is it just like going on a bike ride with your best friend and finally mustering the courage to tell him what's going on or her or whoever, you know, that, you know, that, that matters less than simply getting into the mindset and, and, uh, the behavior of actually mm-hmm. the doing of it. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the same thing with like, when you hear about these stories of men or women coming out of the closet, it's like they held on to this tension and this mm-hmm. resentment and this anger for their whole life. And then they finally open up about it. And it's like, you can literally see them look younger, feel lighter, you know, feel happier about and more fulfilled because they're finally stepping into who they've always been. Yeah, they're, who they they're are. bringing their 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 identity into alignment with you know, their, their outward it. self in alignment with their inward That's self. That's it. So it's like we all have something that we might be holding back from or not be willing to share fully. But I believe when we start to fully share that thing that we that you know, it's either who we are or the things we've been through that mm-hmm. we're scared to share. That's when we can fully step into a lighter, more fulfilled life. Yeah. When I was in rehab, uh, part one of the, t- <laughs> how long were you in rehab for a hundred days, dude? Wow. Yeah. Like out alone in a facility or with like a group of people? Well, it was, it was in a facility. Wow. Um, Could you see I went your family through different no? phases. Well, there was family week. That was super fun where they come <sighs> up and they confront you with all the oh bullshit that you did. <laughs> It must be a yeah. miserable. It was it was super intense. But after I was there, like maybe sixty or seventy days, then I kind of moved out of the like dorm into like a house that was a couple blocks away. Like, and I had a little bit more freedom. But no, I was essentially like my best thinking got me confined to a mental institution, and I stayed there for a hundred days. But like, you know, I was in bad shape when I arrived there. I thought. 
I'll be here for a couple of weeks. You know, I'm, I got to get back to my job, man. You know, like I got a big, important life waiting out here. Like, yeah, I got this problem, but like, I got to spin dry. Cause you don't understand. Like you don't understand my responsibility, you know? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it was terrifying. And I was fully aware that like, you know, look, this was not the plan for my life. Like mm-hmm. I, you know, I was somebody who had a lot of promise and potential as a young person that I squandered. And now here I was, you know, in this, situation that i was deeply ashamed about uh and that's a whole other you know that's a two-hour podcast in and of itself but my point is that i realized the gravity of the situation and i knew that i needed to take it seriously and give myself over to it completely if i really wanted to heal and resolve you know what got me there in the first place and one of the first things that they had us do was write down 10 instances of of your drinking and using like what was your intention going into like let's say oh, my intention was i'm going to go and meet a couple of friends and have a couple of drinks and then right what happened uh i woke up in vegas like in a, naked in a hotel room and didn't know where my wallet was or whatever and then how that impacted other people like how did this create harm to the people in your world and then how did that harm yourself and 10 instances of that. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that super honestly. Like mm. and it was the first time that wow. I was like honest with anybody about like how I was actually living. And I had to read this out loud in front of the whole group of like 40 people that were in this program. Mm. And I had that cathartic experience, but also the counselors were like, yeah, I think you, they're like, I know you want to get out of here in like 28 days, but like, yeah, like you, you need to stick around, dude. Like, this is pretty, you know, like you're, you're pretty far down the line. Oh like we gosh. think you should hang out for a while. Yeah. And wow. I was like, okay, whatever you say, man. And so that's why I ended up staying. It's almost until you fully but, surrender. Yeah. I surrendered because then I can... tried to get sober my way a million times, like using my self will and without taking my mask off, like I'm going to, I'm gonna just going to like will it will myself into fixing this problem because that's how I've solved every other problem in my life. And that's just dug the hole deeper and deeper and deeper until I was so broken. That was my pain moment, my divine moment. And I was like, I I give up like you, whatever you say, (laughs) I'm doing what you, you know, I am here 110% and I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to ask questions or intellectualize what you're telling me to do. I'm just going to do it. Trust the process. Yeah, I had to, to because I had no, I had tried everything else. I had no other options other than to just completely surrender to this thing. And that's what saved my life. So The point being that as scary as it is to surrender, especially for a guy, because we equate it with giving up, relinquishing our power. How dare you? I, I, you know, I'm not going to relinquish. I'm not giving up my power. I was surrendering. Are you kidding me? But that is where you find the strength. It is in that willingness to be vulnerable that your greatest strength lies. And, you know, that is, I don't wish my experience on anybody, but the lesson of that, I think, is what you're trying to convey in this book. And and it is powerful. And it's something that, you know, I think men all over the world are are struggling with silently. Yeah. So I commend you on the book. Thanks, brother. Good job. I wanted to, before we wrap it up, though, I know you went on this silent meditation retreat not not too long ago. Not silent. Not silent. I wasn't silent. But did you go to India? Where did you go? I went to India. To an ashram? It was called One World Academy. Uh Uh-huh. It was powerful. I went for two weeks, didn't leave the premises of this place. And the first, the second or third day, I got really sick from eating something in another city. And so for like three days, I was having like a literal spiritual journey of like purging all these mm. things, you know, from right. like the bad chicken I ate or something. Um, but I had a few days of meditation before that. And then I went through, I was like just in my bed throwing up and going to the bathroom constantly for another couple of days. And then I stayed for an extra week to do to become a meditation instructor and both workshops were so powerful just learning again how to deepen this practice of like forgiveness and inner peace and to remove suffering because i felt like i still hadn't fully had all the tools that i needed to like let go of the mask mm-hmm. and be at peace and last year really helped strengthen my ability to be vulnerable and be at peace and not suffer as much, not feel so guilty or shameful about things. And so meditation has been a huge plus for me. I mean, I've been doing it for years, but this style that I learned and just being in an intensive environment for two weeks where I was, you know, eating vegan and on the ocean and just disconnected from everything 
was another powerful experience for me. So where in India was it? It was near Chennai. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. near Chennai but, on the Bay of Bengal. All right, all right. it's amazing, man. It's a great experience. And and what was the technique? Some of the craziest. Or, they created their own type of technique where they have science. Everything is backed by science, and like the amount of breathing you do, how you breathe, uh, if there's humming involved, like how it's. There's, everything has a purpose. It's not just like, okay, we're just going to breathe for 10 counts. It's like, no, why? Because this mm-hmm. is what happens with the brain and the body when we do these things. So it was all backed by science, which I liked. And there was zero religious talk about anything. There wasn't any connection to God, gods. So none was of there that. a guru? There's no guru. Oh, wow. You there went was, all the way to India and you didn't, get, you didn't sit at the feet no of a guru? guru? Man. There, was te- <laughs> there, was, there was multiple teachers. Uh-huh. So there was like multiple trainers, you know, meditation. They, they lived as monks. So I remember because I'm a pretty like affectionate guy. I kind of hug everyone. And I try to like put my arms out to hug like one of the female teachers. And they were like, no, no, no. no. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. So I, I had a fun like teasing them the whole time, like acting like I was going to touch them. But it was more playful. Um, but it was profound, man. We went to some crazy places in our mind. Like some, they use different techniques. They use music. They use you know, it was dark. We would do it in the middle of the night. They would wake us up and it'd be like 2 a.m. And we'd kind of be like, already be sleepy. And they would just put us in these like meditative states and have us do different exercises and prompts to really try to see how we can eliminate suffering. Hmm. And there's no way to fully eliminate suffering, but we can be aware of it when it happens and then move into a beautiful state quickly. And so that's what they taught us how to do is to be, there's only two states we can live in a suffering state or a beautiful state. And the goal is to always be in a beautiful state when possible, a beautiful state of being. And, uh, you know, just reconfirming these masks. We live in a suffering state when we're wearing a mask as opposed to living in flow, which is a beautiful loving state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a practice you've kept up since you got back. For the first like, four like? months, I was every day. Yeah. I, I do about 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. Just 15 minutes in the morning. I can do it any time during the day, but it's, it's not like TM where you're supposed to do it two times a day or whatever. It's just... There's, I, they, I learned multiple meditations. Multiple meditations to help people when, as, a, as an instructor when they're going through different things. So are stress, you act- actively teaching people now? I haven't been teaching anyone. Home. I've been teaching like you know my girlfriend and stuff like that, but... Mm-hmm. I would think I would need a lot more practice for me to feel comfortable, like facilitating larger groups. I'm sure I could kind of pull it off and get away with it, but I would want to train some more, but I just more wanted to know the deeper side of teaching others in order to teach myself. Right. That's why I wanted to do the, the instructor training. And, uh, I'll tell you what, that time I've never been on like drugs or medication or anything, but I felt like I was able to. And I always felt like I had a very powerful mind, like I could see visions and, and do things with my mind and manifest them in my body in the real world. But man, they just took me to a whole nother level of what was possible in terms of my thinking and thinking so much bigger and expansive than I've ever f- thought before. So for me, I really appreciate that level of expansiveness and consciousness in my mind. And then I want to go back and do more because I feel like I was just getting started. That's pretty cool, man. That's yeah. powerful. It's unbelievable. I mean, oneworldacademy.com. How did you find Like, how did you select this place? I found it. A friend that? of mine, um, a good buddy of mine, had done, had went there for a few days and did it. And it was like, it's life-changing. And this guy's got like super ADD all over the place. Mm-hmm. And I saw him calmer. And he was like, you got to go check this place out. He was like, Tony Robbins went there a few years ago. And he, there's a video of, of Tony Robbins talking about it, actually, where... For 30, 40 years, Tony Robbins always talked about in his workshops. I don't know if you've been to one. He always talks about being in a peak state. He's like, you got to get in a peak state and be peak state 24-7 if you want to create impact and results, right? So he'd always be like, get peak state, get in peak state. Two years ago, he changed his entire language that he's had for four decades or whatever to, it's not a peak state, it's a beautiful state. And there's a distinction it's hard to be at a peak state 24-7. It's hard to, like, be ramped yeah, up. Yeah, well, if you're at a peak state 24-7, then there is no other state. Like, how exactly. you can't be, like, it's a, it's called a peak for a reason. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like, I, yeah. And it's just not sustainable yeah. for the world. And so he learned through this meditation practice about being in a beautiful state. And in a beautiful state, you can be in a peak state. You can be loving. You can be giving. You can be all these things. You're, you're in total flow. 
And um, it's so it's crazy now. You go to his workshop. He talks about let's get into a beautiful state. And he learned it from this mm. workshop experience. And so for a guy who's kind of like always been the teacher for millions of people for decades to be able to change his philosophy I was like, hmm. I was just curious to learn like what this is. Right, so that led you there. And then, how many people were there? Ah, uh, there was probably like twenty, thirty. There was probably like thirty people in like the first week, which was like the the general five day meditation, mm-hmm. like beginners workshop. Then I think there were like six or eight of us in the meditation instructor training mm-hmm. workshop afterwards. So it was it was great, man. If you ever go, I highly recommend yeah, it. Yeah, cool, man. Yeah, I'll check it out. Yeah. All right, man. I think we did it. It was fun, man. So, this is the third time I think you've been on my podcast. I've three I think times? I've been on your. I think so. I think I've only been twice, right? The first time, and then and then when your book came out. Oh, okay, and yeah. So I think this is the third time, and then I think I've been on yours twice. Two or three times, probably. Yeah. So this yeah. is our fifth podcast. It's good, <laughs> man. I think it was the best one, though. This is fun. Maybe it was it's good, fun. right? But it's more organic. The dogs barking. And I know. Everything well, happening. It's, it's real great. life is happening. You know, it's, like, it's great, man. It's it's good, man. Uh, so we can't. We're not living perfect here. You know, we're we're t- we took off our masks. I no. We yeah. I, I don't live in a hermetically sealed world. Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm in acceptance of yes. The, the flow know, of nature. The interferences that that come. <laughs> It's fine. Those are my dogs. Yes. Uh, anyway, so the book comes out October 19th. October 31st. 31st. Halloween, we take off the mask. On Halloween. Oh, on Halloween, we take off. We come as oh a... My God. Come as yourself, Please party. tell me. <laughs> come as your true self. Is this your... Did you come up with that tagline, Lewis? Come as yourselves, baby. Okay. We're all going to have a party on Halloween, then we just show up as we are. Are you going to throw a big Halloween party? No, I'll probably do a party a couple days before because Halloween, everyone's going to want to do something else. Yeah, so. Everybody's got a, got a plan for yeah. that. Well, cool. So, yeah, you're probably about to ramp up a ton of press. You're going to New York and doing yeah. all that kind of stuff. That's the goal. Cool, man. Well, the book is great. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I think it holds the power and the potential to, to help a lot of people. And Thanks, man. That's a good thing in the world, man. So Thanks, you're a blessing. Uh, I appreciate you. This is how you always end your pie. I appreciate you in my life. And I do, man. Uh, it's been a cool journey that we're on. And yeah. uh, it's been great to watch you impact so many people. And I have no doubt that this will only continue to grow and expand. So I wish you well. And best of luck with the book. And Thank you, brother. Let's just uh, talk again soon, man. Thanks, man. All appreciate right? it. So lewishouse.com. You're simple to find on the internet. Yep. <laughs> just at Lewis House everywhere. That's it. And uh, he's cranking out content like nobody's business. Check out the podcast, the book, School of Greatness uh, book as well. And we'll talk again soon, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate right you. Peace. Plants. Plants.